Good afternoon, everyone. I am. I apologize for being late with my reading today. I had another important matter to attend to, uh, but uh, today I'll be reading from the Bible and the Psyche: Individuation Symbolism in the Old Testament by Edward F. Edinger. Welcome everyone. Chapter 14, Conjunctio, the Song of Songs. The Song of Songs is a conjunctio poem, a love drama expressing the union of opposites. The lovers have been given various identifications during centuries of commentary, all of which can be subsumed under the image of the conjunctio as the reconciliation of opposites in the process of individuation. The Jewish sage Sadia stated that the Song of Songs resembles locks to which the keys have been lost. The lost key has now been found by depth psychology. The poem describes the vicissitudes of two lovers, the bridegroom and his beloved, the Shulamite. For the, purposes, for the purpose of exposition, I shall divide the story into a sequence of 10 pictures. One, the Shulamite burned black by the sun, labors in her brother's vineyards and yearns for the bridegroom. I guess this is a Song of Songs one, one, through two, seven. The story begins in a state of servitude. Quote, I am black but lovely, daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the pavilions of Salma. Take no notice of my swarthiness. It is the sun that has burnt me. My mother's sons turned their anger on me. They made me look after the vineyards had I only looked after my own. Song of Songs 1, 5, and 6. The bride and bridegroom, strictly speaking, represent the opposites that constitute the self and are, or should be, quite separate from the ego. In practice, however, the ego is more or less identified with one or both as the archetypal drama unfolds in the individual soul. The initial condition is one of blackness and captivity, corresponding to the alchemical negredo. The Jewish commentators associated the blackness of the Shulamite in the sins of Israel. According to the Targum, quote, when the house of Israel made the calf, their faces grew dark like the Ethiopians who dwell in the tents of Kedar. And when they turned in penitence and their guilt was pardoned them, the precious radiance of their faces increased like the angels, unquote. R. Levi ben Hatta interpreted the blackness to mean, quote, I am black on the days of the week and comely on the Sabbath, black all the days of the year and comely on the day of atonement, black in this world and comely in the world to come. According to Pope, quote, the Greek fathers applying the, this verse to the whole church related the blackness to the Gentile element and the comeliness to the hero, Hebrew. The black and the beautiful the black and the beautiful was also applied to the mixture of saints and sinners, which comprised the church. The Virgin Mary also had her dark days and her beautiful moments, as when her reputation was blackened by slander because of her premarital pregnancy, though she was full of grace and black too, as mother of sorrows, when she stood by the cross and was despised with her son. But, the, but beautiful in the joy of his resurrection." Unquote. 
The alchemist used the image of the black Shulamite as the feminine personification of the prima materia in the negredo state. One text quotes her as attributing her blackness to the original sin of Eve. Oh, that serpent roused up Eve to which I must testify with my black color that clings to me. Jung says, psychologically, this dark figure is the unconscious anima. She represents the anima mundi or Gnostic Sophia caught in the dark embrace of physis of the physical world. The Shulamite tells us she is a captive of her brothers forced to work in their vineyards. Her brothers have been understood as the Chaldeans of Nebuchadnezzar who destroyed Jerusalem and took Judah captive. Psychologically, forced labor in the brothers' vineyards symbolizes subordination of the feminine principle to the masculine or the subordination of the living psyche to abstract rationality. This initial condition calls out for rescue of redemp or redemption. Two, the bridegroom comes to the Shulamite like the coming of spring. Song of Songs 2, 8 through 17. Quote, I hear my beloved see how he comes, leaping on the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle, like a young stag. See where he stands behind our wall. He looks in at the window. He peers through the lattice. My beloved lifts up his voice. He says to me, come then, my love, my lovely one, come. For a sea, winter is past. The rains are over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The season of glad songs has come. The cooing of the turtle dove is heard in our land. Song of Songs 2, 8 through 12. With the coming of the bridegroom, the Shulamite gets the first glimpse of her redemption. A Targum applied the leaping and bounding to the Jews released from bondage in, Europe, in Egypt. Quote, they leaped over the terminal date by virtue of the merit of their father's mountains and skipped over the time of servitude 190 years for the righteousness of their mothers, who are likened to the hills. Christian commentators considered the voice of the beloved to be that of Christ just before his advent, or the voice was the call of resurrection before the second coming. Again, Christ comes leaping to us as we study Holy Scripture in passage after passage on the hills of the Old Testament and on the higher and more conspicuous mountains of the New Testament." Unquote. The bridegroom is identified with spring, bringing flowers and blessed greenness. All green is our bed. Song of Songs 1, 16. The miraculous growth of flowers and greenery are a feature of the conjunctio. It occurs, for instance, with the union of Zeus and Hera in book 14 of the Iliad, quote, his eager arms around the goddess through glad earth perceives and from her bosom pours unbidden herbs and vo voluntary flowers, thick newborn violets a soft carpet spread, and clustering lotus swelled the rising bed, and sudden hyacinth the turf bestrow, and flamy crocus made the mountain glow." Unquote. The philosopher's stone is credited with the power of the vegetation principle to promote trees, plants, flowers, and how to produce and make them grow, flourish and bear fruit, how to increase them in color and smell and when and where we please. An alchemical text quotes the black Shulamite prima materia as saying, I am alone among the hidden. Nevertheless, I rejoice in my heart 
because I can live privily and refresh myself in myself. But under my blackness, I have hidden the fairest green. Jung comments on this passage as follows, quote, the state of imperfection, the state of imperfect transformation merely hoped for and waited for does not seem to be one of torment only, but of positive, if hidden, happiness. It is the state of someone who, in his wanderings among the mazes of his psychic transformation, comes upon a secret happiness which reconciles him to his apparent loneliness. In communing with himself, he finds not deadly boredom and melancholy, but an inner partner. More than that, a relationship that seems like the happenings of a secret love, or like a hidden springtime when the spring, I'm sorry, when the green seed sprouts from the barren earth, holding out the promise of future harvests. It is the alchemical Benedicta Veriditas, Benedicta Veriditas, the blessed greenness, signifying on the one hand, the leprosy of the metals, verdigree, but on the other hand, but on the other, the secret imminence of the divine spirit of life in all things. Three, the lonely Shulamite rises from her bed and searches the streets for her beloved. Song of Songs 3, 1 through 3. On my bed at night, I sought him whom my heart loves. I sought but, not, but did not find him. So I will rise and go through the city and the streets and the squares. I will seek him whom my heart loves. I sought but did not find him. Song of Songs 3, 1 through 3, end quote. The encounter in chapter two was only fleeting, and now again the Shulamite is searching for the bridegroom. Some have suggested that seeking him in bed at night refers to a dream. A Targum identified the missing beloved as the holy presence which had forsaken Israel. Quote, said the Israelites one to the other, quote, let us rise and go and surround the appointment tent which Moses spread outside the camp and let us request instruction from Yahweh and the holy presence which has removed from us, which has been removed from us, end quote. Then they went around in the towns, in the streets and squares, but could not find the holy presence, end quote. Christian commentators have usually understood the object of the quest to be Christ, especially the search for the dead Christ in John 20, 11 through 18. A remarkable alchemical text applies the plight of the Shulamite to the alchemical opus. Quote, be turned to me with all your heart and do not cast me aside because I am black and swarthy because the sun hath changed my color and the waters covered my face and the earth have been polluted and defiled in my works. For there was darkness over it because I stick fast in the mire of the deep and my substance is not disclosed. Wherefore, out of the depths have I cried and from the abyss of the earth with my voice to all you that pass by that pass by the way, attend and see me. If any shall find one like unto me, I will give unto his hand the morning star. <clears throat> For behold, in my bed by night, I sought one to comfort, to comfort me, and I found none. I called and there was none to answer me. Therefore will I arise and go into the city, seeking in the streets and broad ways, a chaste virgin to espouse, comely in face, more comely in body, mostly comely in her garments, that she may roll back the stone from the door of my sepulcher and give me wings like a dove, and I will fly with her 
into heaven and then say, I live forever, end quote. In this passage, the philosopher's stone identified with the Shulamite buried in the prima materia calls for redemption by its conscious realization in the conjunctio. Four, the Shulamite finds the black bridegroom. He comes like a royal procession of King Solomon. Chapter three, four through 11. Quote, what is this coming up from the desert like a column of smoke, breath, breathing of mirror and frankincense and every perfume the merchant knows? See, it is the litter of Solomon around it. <clears throat> Around it are 60 champions, the flower of the warriors of Israel, all of them skilled swordsmen, veterans of battle. Each man has his sword at his side against alarms by night. King Solomon has made himself a throne of wood from Lebanon. The posts he has made, this, made of silver, the posts he has made of silver, the canopy of gold, the seat of purple. The back is inlaid with ebony. Chapter 3, 6 through 10. <clears throat> this passage present, presents the second encounter with the self. This time he is not wild and leaping, but solemn and regal. Commentators equate the column of smoke with the column of cloud by day and fire by night, which indicated the divine presence during the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. Solomon is considered to symbolize either Yahweh or the Messiah. The throne of Solomon, Apirion chariot, is a hapax leg legomenon and seems to designate some sort of litter or portable throne. <clears throat> Jewish interpreters related the term to the tabernacle or the temple and Christian commentators applied it to the church. According to Philo of Carpathia, quote, as Christ made his own human body first to be the litter in which the Godhead is born, so he made the church the vehicle in which he, the man God, would be carried in procession among the people to whom he comes as king and conqueror." Unquote. Five, the bride and bridegroom meet in the garden. The bridegroom praises the bride, but is wounded by her. Chapter four, one to chapter five, one. Quote, how beautiful you are, my love, how beautiful you are. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats frisking down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes as they come up from the washing. Each one has its twin, not one unpaired with another. Your lips are a scarlet thread and your words enchanting. Your cheeks behind your veil are halves of pomegranate. Your neck is the tower of David built as a fortress, hung round with a thousand bucklers, and each of the shield of a hero, and each the shield of a hero. Your two breasts are two fawns, twins of a gazelle that feed among the lilies. Chapter four, one through five. <clears throat> For the Jewish interpreters, the beauty of the bride refers to Israel's devotion to the law. For Christians, the reference is either to the church or to the con contemplative soul kindled with longing for God. For Jews, her two breasts looking to the past are Moses and Aaron. Looking to the future, they are the two messiahs. For Christians, they are the two testaments, the twin precepts, love of God and love of nature, the blood and water which flowed from the side of the crucified Christ, etc. 
The encounter in the garden includes pain as well as pleasure. The bridegroom is wounded, quote, you ravish my heart, my sister, my promised bride. You ravish my heart with a single one of your glances. Chapter four, nine. <clears throat> The Douay version says, quote, thou hast wounded my heart with one of your, thy eyes, unquote. This image refers to the wounding effect of being seen by the other. One aspect of the conjunctio is that the opposites are seen by each other. The ego is seen by the self and the self is seen by the ego. Each becomes an object of knowledge and perception by the other which has a wounding or violating effect. As Jung tells us, the integration of contents that were always unconscious and projected involves a serious lesion of the ego. Likewise, the self in its original unconscious state is wounded in the process of conscious realization. Just as the ego is emptied by encounter with the other, so also is the self. This theme is expressed in the doctrine of kenosis based on Philippians 2, 6 and 7, which describes the incarnation of Christ as a process of emptying. His state was divine, yet he did not cling to his equal, yet he did not cling to his equality with God, but emptied himself to assume the condition of a slave and became and became as men are. The theme of emptying also appears in the concept of tzimtzum as developed in the Kabbalah of Isaac Luria. Sholem describes tzimtzum as follows, quote, it means briefly that the existence of the universe is made possible by a process of shrinking, shrinkage in God. If God is all in all, how can there be things which are not God? Thus, God was compelled to make room for the world by, as it were, abandoning a region within himself, a kind of mystical primordial space from which he withheld in order, from which he withdrew in order to return to it in the act of creation and revelation, unquote. Thus, the encounter between God and the world, self and ego, involves a wounding or diminishment of God. Honorius applies this image to Christ and the church. Quote, so was Christ upon the cross wounded for love by his church. Thou didst wound my heart when I was scoured for thy love, that I might make thee my sister, Again, thou didst wound my heart with one of thine eyes when, hanging upon the cross, I was wounded for love of thee, that I might make thee my bride to share my glory." Unquote. The bridegroom six, the bridegroom knocks at the Shulamite's door, but she is slow in answering and he is gone. Chapter five, two through five and six. Quote, I sleep, but my heart is awake. I hear by my beloved knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of night. I have taken off my tunic. Am, am I to put it on again? I have washed my feet and I to dirty them again. Am I to dirty them again? My beloved thrust his hand through the hole in the door. I trembled to the core of my being. Then I rose to open to my beloved. Myrrh ran off my hands, pure myrrh off my fingers, onto the handle of the bolt. I opened to my beloved but he had turned his back and gone. 
my soul failed at his flight. Chapter five, two through five and six. Unquote. The, re the reference to sleeping suggests that this passage may refer to a dream, certainly a knock on the door, which one is reluctant to answer, is a common dream theme representing an unconscious content trying to gain admission to consciousness. The conjunctio is both desired and dreaded. From a distance, it is the source of all yearning, but knocking at our door, it is an object of terror. Once seen and then lost, it is a Once seen and then lost, it is an occasion for despair. Okay. Seven, the Shulamite again goes in search of the lost bridegroom. Chapter five, six. Quote, I sought him, but I did not find him. I called to him, but he did not answer. Chapter five, six. The divine presence has removed itself from Israel, or wisdom neglected has departed. Quote, then they shall call to me, but I will not answer. They shall seek the they shall seek me eagerly and shall not find me. Proverbs 1 28. 8. The watchmen beat the Shulamite and steal her cloak. Quote, the watchmen came upon me as they made their rounds in the city. They beat me, they wounded me. They took away my cloak, they who would guard the ramparts. Chapter 5, 7. For Jews, the watchmen were the Chaldeans who besieged Jerusalem for Christians. For Christians, they were the pagan Roman rulers who persecuted. Sorry. who persecuted the church and stripped the martyrs of that outer vest of flesh, which covered their souls. Psychologically, they are the guardians of the ramparts of the status quo, which is always an enemy of individuation. In chapter four, six, the bridegroom had, was wounded. Now it is the bride's turn. The opposites cannot meet without wounding each other. <clears throat> Nine, bride and bridegroom find each other and unite in the garden of the pomegranates. Chapter six, one through eight and three. Or I'm sorry, chapter six, one to chapter eight, three, quote. Come, my beloved, let us go to the fields. We will spend the night in the villages, and in the morning we will go to the vineyards. We will see if the vines are budding, if their blossoms are opening, if the pomegranate trees are in flower. Then I shall give you the gift of my love. Chapter 7, 11 through 13. <clears throat> The conjunctio is consumed with the union of bride and bridegroom, symbolizing all the pairs of opposites. Now it is established the eternal alliance between Yahweh and Israel, the millennial marriage between Christ and his church, or according to the Kabbalah, the sacred union between the Holy One, blessed be he, and his Shekinah. Rabbi Sim Rabbi Simon ben Jochai, the presumed author of the Zohar, described the sacred conjunctio on his deathbed in these words, quote, when the mother is separated and joined, and joined with the king face to face in the excellence of the Sabbath, all things become one body. And then the Holy One, blessed be he, sitteth on his throne and all things are called the complete name, the holy name. 
blessed be his name forever and unto the ages of the ages. When this mother is conjoined with the king, all the worlds receive blessing and the universe is found to be in joy." Unquote. Jung had a similar conjunctio vision while conv convalescing from a near fatal illness. He describes it as follows, quote, everything around me seemed enchanted. At this hour of the night, the nurse brought me some food she had warmed. For only then was I able to take any and I ate with appetite. For a time, it seemed to me that she was an old Jewish woman, much older than she actually was, and that she was preparing ritual kosher dishes for me. When I looked at her, she seemed to have a blue halo around her head. I myself was, so, to, so it seemed, in the Pardis Ramonium, the garden of pomegranates, and the wedding of Tifereth with Malkuth was taking place, or else I was Rabbi Simone ben Jochar, whose wedding in the afterlife was being celebrated. It was the mystic marriage as it appears in the Kabbalistic traditions. I cannot tell you how wonderful it was. I could only think continually, quote, now this is the garden of pomegranates. Now this is the marriage of Malkuth with Tephereth. I do not know exactly what part I played in it. At bottom, it was itself. I was the marriage, I was the marriage. And my beatitude was that of a blissful, uh, and my beatitude was that of a blissful wedding. Gradually, the garden of pomegranates faded away and changed. There followed the marriage of the lamb in a Jerusalem festively bedecked. I cannot describe what it was like in detail. These were ineffable states of joy. Angels were present and light. I myself was the marriage of the lamb. That too vanished and there came a new image, the last vision. I walked up a wide valley to the end when a gentle chain of hills began. The valley ended in a classical amph amphitheater. It was magnificently situated in the green landscape. And there in this theater, the Heros Gamos, the Heros Gamos was being celebrated. Men and women dancers came to stage and upon a flower deck couch, all, fa all Father Zeus and Hera consummated the mystic marriage as it is described in the Iliad. All these experiences were glorious. Night after night, I floated in a state of the purest bliss, thronged round with images of all creation. Hi, James, nice to see you. Um, right, that's what it is. Or that's what it's like, <laughs> for sure. Oh, oh God, I've almost done it again, but I only have one more short part, about a half a page. 10. The united lovers are sealed to each other in eternal love. Chapter 8, 5 through 7, quote, let me like a seal on your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is strong as death, jealousy, relentless as Sheol. Chapter 8, 6. This final image corresponds to the creation of the philosopher's stone, the immortal body strong as death. It symbolizes the eternal atemporal fruits of individuation. The opposites that were torn apart at the birth of consciousness in the Garden of Eden are reunited and sealed as belonging to each other. This new condition is symbolically equivalent to the messianic age. Thus the verse, quote, 
I should lead you, I should take you into my mother's house and you would teach me. I should give you special wine to drink, juice of my, juice of my pomegranates. Chapter eight, two was applied to the messianic banquet. Quote, I would lead you, O King Messiah, and bring you up to my temple and you will teach me to fear before Yahweh and to walk in his ways. And there we shall partake of the feast of Leviathan and will drink old wine as preserved in the grape since the day the world was created and from the pomegranates and fruits prepared for the righteous in the Garden of Eden, unquote. One more paragraph, I hope I can get through it. <laughs> the united opposites generate love and jealousy, Ahabath and Kina. Rendered in the Septuagint as agape and zealous, these terms correspond to the two poles of cosmogonic libido. To unite them in consciousness corresponds to Jung's description of the moral task of alchemy, which is to bring the feminine maternal background of the masculine psyche seething with passions into harmony with the principle of the spirit. Truly a labor of Hercules. And that is quoted from Mysterium Conjunctionis, Collected Works 14, paragraph 35. Okay, so we are down to uh, one chapter. I believe that is true. Yeah, one chapter, Mes Messiah the Self-Realized. And I will be reading that tomorrow, um, possibly at 4.30, although I may do it earlier. Just depends on the weather and whether I can get out of my house. Uh, my wife and I are girding ourselves for a year and a half in quarantine until we have a, a uh, vaccine for the coronavirus since everyone in my household, including my mother-in-law, are in the uh, at-risk group. Uh, we're going to have to be very, very careful when when our president or when everybody talks about flattening the curve that flattening of the curve only means you'll be able to get a ventilator if you get coronavirus and the problem is that when they give you a ventilator because you're sick uh it's an intrusive ventilator that's what they're specifying in the various websites that are talking about it so it's not fun and so I would urge everyone to keep yourselves safe and try to prevent yourself from getting the coronavirus. It's uh, very deadly. Anyway, uh, thank you for being with me today. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for the last chapter. I've been reading uh, the Bible and the Psyche, Individuation Symbolism in the Old Testament by Edward F. Edinger. And tomorrow I will be reading chapter 15. Okay, enjoy your evening.